Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ronan. I'm the uh, community moderator for testhuddle.com, and I will be introducing the webinar today. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar series. Today is the first day of uh, three days of uh, webinars on test automation we have at Test Huddle this week. So today we have Kim. And the following webinars we'll have on Wednesday, we'll have Dorothy presenting. And finally, on Thursday, we'll have Jared presenting. So a lot to look forward to this week, um, all on the approaches to test automation and a good way to get yourself uh, ready for 2016 uh, for this topic. Kim will be presenting today. Um, Kim it works for Microsoft in the USA, so he's based in Seattle. So... Um, We'd like to thank Kim for uh, getting up a bit early this morning for uh, to present the webinar. And he's presenting um, on testing as a bottleneck. So um, the full title, Testing, How Testing Slows Down Modern Development Processes and How to Compensate. The webinar will can start shortly with Kim, but uh, I just want to point you to the question section. So if at any time during the webinar you have questions, about the topic or um, about anything else, you can enter the question uh, in your uh, box on the right-hand side there. Uh, you can enter a question directly to me. So if you have questions, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar with Kim. So he'd be delighted to answer uh, any of your questions. And if any other questions related to the webinar, for example, problems with audio or anything, do please put them in there as well, and I'll do my best to help you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kim and uh, let Kim uh, begin his presentation. So over to you, Kim. Thank you so much. So give me one second to show things up. Here we go. Yes, you see it now. So these are my slides. So good morning, everybody, or good afternoon in your place, uh, wherever you are. So yeah, I'm, I have to apologize. So if this is going to be a more of a rough um, ride this morning, then um, for me at 6 o'clock in the morning, that's not usually my, my good time. But anyway, so what I'm going to do is I try to convince you or show you how testing actually is a bottleneck, especially for more than software development processes um, and, and how we can compensate for that. So but as a first thing, um, I want to give you some quick overview of what I'm actually doing over here, which might be important. So I have to actually admit that I'm not really a tester, so I'm more a data analyst and data science. And basically what I'm doing is I'm analyzing development processes here at Microsoft, so that's my full-time job. So I'm working for Tools for Soft Engineers. Um, what we actually do is we provide internal tools for soft engineers here at Microsoft. Um, that can be things like Visual Studio, but there are much more tools that we actually use in our daily development process. Uh, this is um, from build tools and services to verification tools, which obvious, obviously include testing, but also code reviews. And we go into this area a bit more. Um, there's some artifact management, which is essentially if you're developing, for example, Java, that would be something like um, um, uh, Maven packages and C Sharp. These are NuGet packages. We store them, we distribute them um, in, in inside Microsoft. And then the gray bar, the um, lower right part of the um, of this um, of this quadrant is basically the analytical part. That's where I'm based in, and which I'm actually um, doing. So what we actually also do is we provide all the different. So what we actually do is we collect data, um, all the different artifacts that are, you know, created by using all these tools. For example, builds, tests, test execution, test runs, test results but then also code reviews, um, discussions about code reviews, and so on. We all analyze them. We store them uh, in a big Azure blob. We analyze them and then provide analytics, uh, analytics for the individual teams. So we actually give feedback on how are people using these tools, how is it fitting their development process, where do we see bottlenecks, how can teams be more effective in using these tools. And of course today, especially in terms of testing, um, but then we also collect feedback in terms of how are people seeing these tools, what do they like, what do they not like, um, and how can we improve our tools so that actually people, you know, can make better use of our tools, um, especially internally. Okay, going and uh, now switching gears to testing. So one thing we definitely, um, definitely realized um, um, in the last couple of years is that actually a lot of people treat testing as a separate parallel process rather than interlinking it with the normal development process. 
and this is due to many many different um, um, scenarios um, most of them are because you know people treat testing as a destructive kind of programming right so people especially younger people like to see their individual um, um, like to see their individual oops um, individual um, uh, code actually go into the field, right? You want to program, you want to see your code actually go into a live product that is going to be used by a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, testing is more of the destructive side where people actually write some program that destroys other people's program or crashes the program. So this is kind of seen as the non-optimal way of programming. And so a lot of people start preferring writing real code rather than test code. And therefore, due of this neat nature, which is a very human nature, um, Verification sometimes is seen as, you know, the secondary threat of parallel processing uh, development. So, um, sorry, Kim. And, uh, and if I talk about testing, I sometimes, yes, sir. Sorry, Kim. Yeah, um, uh, just a few people are pointing out that the slides don't appear to, are appear a bit zoomed in. Uh, they're cut off at the bottom of the screen. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Let me see. And the Why bottom and the right. The bottom and the right. Let me see. Let me share my full screen then. Maybe that makes things a bit better. Yes, so, perfect. Yep, that's working. And then I do this. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry about that. Yeah, you're okay. Um, sure. So um, basically, if we if I talk about testing, I also mean verification processes. So a lot of people, if we talk about testing, they just refer to functional correctness, which is mainly unit testing. But there are a lot of different other techniques that we use to verify um, our, our software during development processes. So one is functional correctness. But in particular, what I'm going to talk about is system integration testing. So this is kind of what we call constraint verification. So you can have a lot of different constraints on a system. If you think about Windows, for example, you want to check whether you know, things are booting up in time, um, things are not crashing. If they're crashing, they're crashing in a certain manner. Um, we have to verify that, you know, we um, uh, comply with all the um, EU regulations about software and so on and so on. There's build verification, there's static analysis, there's code reviews, and of course there are others, right? Um, so if we go quickly through them, so functional correctness um, is essentially um, super fast, so functional or unit tests are running very fast in seconds, but it is a very limited scope. So you have a unit, maybe even, you know, a DLL or a binary that you can that you can test, but even if you have tested all the individual modules of your software system, it doesn't mean that your overall system actually works out, right? Um, so what you actually do in this particular case is then you go to constraint verification or system integration testing. Um, there you have the full scope, which is good because you know you know, you deploy a VM, for example, you install this, I don't know, Windows on it, you have the full system, you can have a test bed, you can run whatever you want, and you know exactly how it will behave at the at the client desktop. But these tests are very, very slow, right? Because just setting up the VM, installing Windows, booting it up is taking a lot of time. So here we're not talking about seconds, we're talking about hours of one test pass. Um, we have build verification, which is very essential, but again, very basic, even more basic than unit testing. Static analysis, um, you know, people, um, there's a lot of discussion about static analysis, whether we should use it or we shouldn't use it. So there are many false positives in static analysis, but it can be very helpful for particular scenarios, for example, about security, right? There are very um, specific security rules for static analysis that are very, very helpful to determine certain issues there. And then we have code reviews, um, and we spend a lot of time in code reviews. Um, at this company, I think we spend about an hour per engineer per day on code reviews. But we actually found out that you know code reviews are more about maintenance; they are not so much about bugs. So what actually people talk about is you know coding style, code, good behavior in terms of coding, uh, maybe you know um, coding conventions in this kind of sense. But very rarely we actually find any bugs in code reviews. Um, but you see, you know, there's a very, you know, broad um, set of tools that we're actually using um, in, in verification and testing. But if we then go one sli um, slide further, so what I'm showing here is essentially how a development team, this is one particular team, is outlining the development process. And this is not so much representative for all the teams, but it is kind of describing very nicely how people in, in, in a broad sense, um, or many, many teams in a broad sense, um, would 
characterize the development process, the overall development process. So you, on the left hand side what you have is basically the inner loop which is everything that happens on the engineering desktop. So there is something like coding, obviously you, have, you, you need to write your code, you have version control branches, IDE, even dev tools, uh, compilers for example. You then do local and body builds, you do unit testing, there's something which we call pre-check and verification or validation. Um, I apologize for all the typos, but it's really a, 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 basically a screenshot of the slide that I took from the team. So pre-check and very, uh, validation, there are private tests, so you can run whatever tests you want, you are in full control of what you are doing. You can, you know, have a special test that are not even official tests, or you can just run a subset of tests very quickly. Most of the tests that you run on your site are functional correctness tests um, and some static analysis. And then you have code reviews, so whenever you want to check in your code, you actually need to have a code review, so at least two people have to actually review your code changes and have to provide feedback and have to sign off. So without having a code review with a sign off, you're not allowed to check in. Um, you can still do, but you better be 100% correct about what you're doing, because if you don't have a code review sign off and you mess something up, then you're in deep trouble. And code reviews are kind of gates, right? So as you see here, code reviews are the last step. So once a code review is signed off, um, people then start checking in their code. So it then becomes basically an official kind of process that takes over, and that's the right-hand side, that's the integration process, or what they call outer loop. Um, and there, everything is out of control of the engineer, right? So the, the left-hand side is totally in control of the engineer. He's, he's the guy who is deciding what is happening when and where. On the right-hand side, the outer loop, everything is, you know, it's one process. There's no way you can control what is happening there. Um, basically, your code goes into a different branch. Um, we do some build verification. Can we actually build the system? Can we link it? Can we deploy it? Um, we still run some unit testing, but most of the um, testing on this side is end-to-end -end verification. So basically, you know, as I said before, system integration tests. Can we actually deploy this thing? What are certain scenarios that we definitely want to have um, being checked? Can we actually um, do something like what we call build drops? So even if we compile things, can we actually deploy it to a machine? Can we install a VM with it? Um, then we deploy sometimes, for example, if you're developing a service like Bing, we deploy basically the system to a test bed. Um, we, we feed it to dog fooding, what basically means that engineers are using actually not the official version of the product, but you know last week's um, uh, version of the product. So basically that's kind of a very, very early alpha or beta um, testing intern internally. And then we have, even if you go then to production, you, 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 know, you turn something live, you still have kind of flightning system and watchdogs that actually you know, look at the code, um, look at what, uh, or how are people using these systems, um, is it working out? And if there are any bugs appearing in the system, um, how can we then also replicate them internally again to provide feedback? So in some sense, to, to some degree, you can also say, you know, uh, we use users sometimes as testers, um, especially internally, right? But that gives you an overview, and, and very nicely, if you, if you look at all these different bullet points, then you, you see that most of these bullet points are about verification, right? There's only one block, basically the coding block, and maybe the code review block, where we talk about coding um, and actually creating code. All the rest is about verification, right? And that gives you already a sense how important verification is, right? Because it will determine how good our product will be as we ship it. But it also shows you if we improve or if we optimize verification, how much of a uh, gain we could potentially get, right? So for example, if we you know cut down testing and verification in half, then all these loops would run in half the time, which will, of course, um, would be very great for, for our development process because we could shorten it. And this is exactly what we want to do, right? So in, in modern times, especially nowadays, right? So releasing a software, even big products like, you know, uh, Windows just went from a two-year release cycle or two-and-a-half-year release cycle to a one-year release cycle. Uh, Office as a service, as Office 365, we are even releasing software on a monthly, weekly, and sometimes even daily or even hourly basis, right? If you look at Facebook, I think Facebook uh, releases software in every hour or every two hours. Um, Amazon does the same. Um, we do this with Bing. We release once a day. Um, so there's an in incredible speed or incredible need of fast release cycles in there. Um, and, and again, or why are people doing this?
this or why are companies especially doing this? Well, it's because um, you know we want to gain or defend market share. So people want to have more and more features, um, and um, it, it doesn't really matter whether they're going to use these features, but they want to have them at their fingertips. Um, and they assume quality, privacy, uh, and, and security, right? That's all assumed, but what they actually pay money for is actually features, right? And, and that means, you know, if you are on a fast, on a shorter release, uh, sorry, on a longer release cycle than your competitor, it means you just, you know, you lose basically market share. Um, and that's what drives your revenue and so forth and so forth, right? So there is an increasing pressure on, um, on speeding up release cycles to, you know, enforce agility. Um, but it also re it requires a lot of product teams to be very flexible. All these development processes have to change. They need to be, be faster. They need to be speed up. Um, and that in turn means we have less time for, for system and testing, right? Especially for system testing. So if you, if you think about it, if we release software every hour, right, that means that every change that goes into a system as it is right now, we have at maximum 60 minutes to test, right? And obviously, we don't have to test a full system because it did not the full system change. But still, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be somehow at risk because every potential change is a risk to your system, right? Um, and so, the, the, as a matter of fact, we cannot simply run all the tests at any uh, at any point in time anymore, um, right? If you if you have all the code changes, you have all the tests, you have to decide which tests you want to run on which code changes. We need to be very clever in terms of how we select the right test at the right time, and essentially. Um, it's all about risk management, right? So if you think about it, if you make a code change, this is kind of a risk. You want to minimize the risk of, you know, that you just introduced a bug and that you're shipping the bug to, to the customer. And so um, what we are doing here is actually playing kind of a game, a risk management game, and say, you know, if I run only a certain set of tests, um, then I should choose them in a way that, you know, I minimize the risk of um, elapsing bugs to to um, to customers as much as possible by requiring as less time as possible, right? And very importantly, um, and that's what people sometimes forget, um, there's always a trade-off between risk and quality, cost and speed, right? And it's very simple to increase one of these, you know, triangle buck uh, triangle um, buckets down there by compromising another one. But what you actually want to do is you want to keep them all in sync. Right. So I give you an example. For example, you can say, you know, I can increase speed very easily by running less tests, um, right? But if I'm not clever, I'm not doing this very clever, then I, I will blow up cost, right? Because if I'm not clever, then uh, my quality will actually drop at the customer end. People are not buying my products anymore, or I'm actually getting sued for products or oh, bugs that I have in the product of code, and so you know. Um, so everything you do to this individual system is a val val very well-balanced set of, um, of um, uh, aspects that we have here. And if we impact one aspect of this development process, then we will also have to make sure that the system will keep in balance. Um, and if you look then at product types and release cycles, so if you are in the service and agile world, you have planning, implementation, unit testing, code reviews, dog fooling, and deploy, and you can do stuff very, very quickly. But if you're on a box product, um, type of product, right? So for example, Office as it ships to the customer or Windows is the classical box product, right? You pretty much go through the same release cycle, but um, since you're not in control of your deployment environment, right? Um, you, I mean, if you, for example, you're Bing or you're Google or you're Facebook, you own your service, you know what kind of hardware we have, we, you know what software is installed, you control everything. Um, so basically, you don't have to have, for example, bigger system tests or even platform testing, right? Because you have only one platform you deploy to, so you can actually spare platform testing. You can spare the shipping because you just press on a button, you deploy to your data center, and there it is. That makes bug fixing, for example, also very cheap. But if you're on a box product, you rely on the customer to actually apply all these things, right? You, if you have a bug in the field, we have to actually ship the, the bug fix to the, um, to the customer. And if you think about Windows, right, we have uh, over a million possible configuration in terms of software, what is installed, which drivers, which hardware does he have, is he still having, you know, the printer from 1979 and we still want to support it? Well, if he has, we have to test it. So we have full buildings uh, with hardware where we run 24-7 testing, for example, for Windows on this. 
And what we want to get and what you see that a lot of people actually, or a lot of development teams want to go from this typical box product to, to a mixed product or to a service product, right? And, and doing this, classical example is Office. Office is now Office 365. It's actually a service, right? Or it's, it's a box product, but also a service. And, you know, transforming a box product to a service kind of world or agile kind of world. In the beginning, this is very, very hard. And the, the further you, 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 can, you can do this transition, it's getting much, much easier, right? But it's a hard problem, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. It's, it, it requires a lot of thinking. And it requires a lot of money to do it. And on the long the way, you have to change your development processes. OK, so how do we test uh, a system like Windows offers or SQL L server then? And with how, I mean, you know, where do we test it? Um, when do we test it? Who is testing it? And how frequent are we testing it, right? So these are all questions, basically, that come to your mind, especially if we think, for example, about Office, if we want to shift this now to a service-like product, right? Um, how do we change this? How, what do we have to do to make this happen? Um, and I showed you an example. An example is Windows, and this is a very, you know, old school kind of um, example. And it's not representative for all the products, but I will give. I want to give you a very bad example to show you how hard a problem like this can be. So what you see in the right hand side here is essentially a branching tree. So every node in this tree is a source code branch, basically one copy of the source code um, at any point in time, and, and um, you have edges between individual nodes or branches if there are integration paths between the individual branches. And it works as follows. So as an engineer, you normally, if you, you know, you have your inner loop, which we saw uh, on the previous slides, your desktop, right? You do whatever you want. This is not modeled in here. So this tree is only showing the outer loop, right? The, the, in, the integration process. So once you have your code review, you have to develop your software, your code review is a sign off. You check into any of these leaf nodes of this tree. Right, so any kind of leave notes in the tree, you check in your code. Um, that's, these are so-called development branches. And um, once the code change is good to go, you start pushing these code changes um, towards the root node. And the root node of the tree, uh, of the tree, is the main branch or the trunk branch of Windows, which is basically called WinMain. It holds the current version of Windows as is as it is as we would ship today. So basically, that's also where we ship um, every Friday dog fooding to the development machines from. So you start pushing these code changes towards the inner node uh, of the tree, towards the root node. Um, and this is a massive system, right? So you, you, you have to think about we have more than 10,000 engineers working on the system. You have, at any point in time, more than one point, I think 1.5 million lines of code changing at every single second in this system. And we start have to integrate them, right? So you have 10,000 people working in parallel, so they need some kind of isolation, but also some kind of synchronization between them, and that's why these branches come in. And if you think about testing um, comes into here, um, then every every edge in this tree is guarded by a so-called quality gate, which you can think of as a big system integration test suite. Um, essentially, what we do is if you say, you know, I want to push my changes from one of the leave nodes to the next higher inner or to the next inner node of the tree, so to one step towards WinMain, um, you, you basically create a request, um, an integration request. Um, then the system will go take your integration request, takes the code that you have just submitted for the integration request. It will deploy um, Windows on multiple virtual machines, um, will take your code, put it on the VM, and then we run the full test suite. And as I said before, this can take hours. Um, essentially, and if you know if the test suite is green or passing, it means your integration request is granted and your code is actually moved from the from your current branch to the next um, lower level branch or to one step towards uh, WinMain. And if the quality gate is failing, then it means that your integration request is denied. Means that we have found an issue with the current code base, and your branch will be blocked. It will be frozen until you resolve this issue. Now, very importantly, um, these test failures, unlike on the development machine, right, on the inner loop, these test failures are not isolated. That means if you fail a quality gate, then everybody that is working under your branch subtree will suffer from that because his branch will now be frozen because somebody checked in something that causes a quality gate to fail, right? So that means um, if, you, if you just fail a quality gate, then potentially a thousand people sitting on their desktop cannot uh, integrate any further because you just messed up something, right? 
Um, and again, so this is a very expensive kind of system, a very old school kind of system, but it is due to the fact that we have so many engineers working on one particular, you know, monolithic code base. Um, we have more than 10,000 quality gates executed every day. We have more than 1 million test cases executed in this scenario, right, test steps, basically. Um, we have to test on different branches, obviously but also on different architectures, different languages, different devices, different platforms, different combination of drivers and so forth, right? So actually at one quality gate in the system is not really one test suite execution, but it's actually a, a big, big set of test suites um, that get executed. Um, because we want to make sure that we actually comply with all the constraints on every potential, you know, configuration as it can appear in the field. Um, and clearly, this system was designed in the beginning, you know, finding any kind of code issues as early as possible in the system, which we all agree makes sense because, you know, finding bugs earlier than later is just um, is just cheaper, but it slows down your product development, right, quite a bit because we have to run all the tests on all different uh, code changes as they appear in the system. And, and, and now going one step back, um, if you think about this, then it means that verification time defines basically the lower bound of how fast we can deliver software, right? So basically, if you make your change, you have to submit it to one of the leave nodes. We can, the earliest time we can ship this code change is when it actually was, made its way into the trunk, um, into the root node of the tree in the trunk branch, right? And um, basically, the time it needs to go from one of the leave nodes to the trunk branch is basically verification time because we have to merge all these individual code changes against each other. We have to verify them. And if this is done, then we are actually good to go to ship. But this time, basically, is verification time. It defines the lower bound of how fast we can actually develop software. Okay, so this is setting kind of, you know, some of the challenges that we have at Microsoft at least, and I know from a lot of discussions with Ericsson, with, with Facebook, with Google, um, and so forth, that many of these teams have also the, the very same problems, although, you know, that it wouldn't have this kind of big um, branching tree, but still they're having the problem of system integration tests that these tests are too slow. So and I want to go through three um, challenges, hopefully I have time for three, but at least two challenges and how we currently think of tackling them. Um, and, you know, if you have any comments about, on that or any feedback, I'm very happy. You know, you can drop me an email or uh, uh, send it afterwards uh, to the chat. So one pro particular problem that we see is what we call false test alarms. Sometimes, you know, people are calling it flaky tests or, you know, however you want to call it, essentially a false alarm is any kind of test that fails but not hints to a code defect, but rather to a test issue or an infrastructure issue, right? And what we are currently thinking of, so we're treating tests still, as you know, it's either passing or failing, so it's a binary decision. But actually what we should do and what a lot of teams start thinking about is, you know, there are different buckets of test failures that you can see. Um, and I just put in here free, you know, you can have 20 of them at least. Um, so there's a, you know, a thing, if you would start from the, from the right-hand side, so what, there's something like a blocker. So that is kind of what we currently, um, you know, would imagine as a test failure. So every test failure is blocking the integration request or is blocking you from going any further. That means you definitely have to address the issue right now, right here, right? There's no way we can, we can wait for any kind of fix. But then there are also sometimes test failures where you say, you know, yeah, you know, it is. It, it might be a bug. Um, we're not sure yet, but even if it's a bug, you know, it will, you know, impact 0.05% of our customer base. So maybe we can, you know, either we don't have to fix this right now. We can either fix this in a, in a, in a week, and it doesn't mean that we ship the bug to the um, to the customer, you know, but we can still say we ship, you know, next week we ship. We don't have to apply the fix right now. We can do this still, you know, by the end of the week. But it shouldn't stop the integration process at um, at all. And there are sometimes, you know, failure severity where we say don't care. Either it's not your code, you take a dependency, it's a bug on your code, there's nothing you can do, or it's actually not really a code defect, right? It's just, you know, you have a task that runs in a machine, the machine has a broken network card, but it wants to consume a file over the network. Obviously, the test will fail because, you know, the network isn't reachable, but the test failure has nothing to do with the, the actual code quality, right? Because, you know, the code can still be good. Um, it's just that the the test didn't succeed to run. 
So we looked about them, right? So the most left don't care. Mostly there are test issues. It's not my code, or it will not fix. Because, um, for example, you know, um, this is a system. You know, it is a system that we're not supporting anymore. Something like that. Can wait are normally low priority bugs. It's before release. We have a long time to go till the release, so we can still fix it afterwards. There's some refactoring going on, which we know will actually eventually actually um, be resolved, but not now. And as, as I said, blocker are kind of fix it now. I need to do this now. And basically, everything that is not a blocker at the moment you can treat as a false test alarm, right? So can wait things can be false test alarms. Sometimes they are not. It really depends where you want to draw the line. But the, the main point here is, you know, there is something like what we call test failure severity, rather than just treating it as a binary test or pass, uh, a failure, a failure pass, right? Um, and each false alarm is very expensive, or can potentially be very expensive because it requires human interaction and normally humans are the most expensive part of, uh, of our development process. Machines, machines are usually cheap. Um, it usually um, basically blocks an interior creation request, right? So your, your, your branch in the Windows example would be frozen for a particular point in time. You need to fix this um, and potentially 10,000 or even 1,000 people are waiting for you to fix this, although it's not your fault because, you know, the, you can't fix the network card. Um, and very importantly, if you have a lot of these false test alarms, and, and, and very sadly, a lot of systems have a lot of false test alarms or flaky tests, um, they might even hide real defects, right? Because you get so many false test alarms that, you know, chances when you see test failure is very high that it's a false test alarm. Anyway, you, tr you start, you know, treating this as, you know, I don't care. Uh, it's a false alarm, test alarm anyway. I'm signing still off. Uh, but which means that, you know, under, you know, 100 failures, there can be one that really hints to a defect. And you just, you know, go over it because, you know, the other 99 were just false alarms. So it is very expensive in multiple dimensions. And it's really a problem that all our teams and also a lot of industrial teams, for example, at Google, Facebook and others uh, really have. Um, so very quickly, a false alarm is any kind of test failure that not hints to a code defect in our particular case. That's how we define it. Um, and you can detect these things um, automatically, but with a very long delay, right? So what we typically do is we look at a test execution, whether it failed. We then check, is there actually a bug report that we can map to it? If no, well, you know, most likely this is not, not really a code defect because nobody even dared to open a bug report for it. If the bug report was fixed and we saw a fix that actually resulted in a code change to productive code, so to code that we will ship, then this would be a code defect. Everything else we treat as a false positive at the moment. And you might disagree with this categorization, and a lot of teams do, and we have very, you know, differentiated um, processes on how to define what is a true positive and false positive for individual teams, but that is just, just a highlight on how to do things. But tracing all these actions, what is happening after test execution takes time, right? It takes days, sometimes even weeks, um, but that's not good enough, right? Because what you actually would like to do is you want to mark or classify a false positive failure as soon as it appears in the system. So what we would like to have, and that was the goal, um, that we have the goal in here, so we want to have an immediate identification of false test, test alarms. So for example, we can just basically filter them out. So we can say, engineer, you have 100 test failures. All of them seem to be false alarms because of a network issue. Um, we still show them to you. It's your call whether you want to go ahead or not, but you know we gave you some pre-classification which might help you to understand the reason behind the test failure. We want to avoid any runtime overhead simply because we still don't have enough time to run all the tests. If we now run, you know, have an overhead and runtime, we can even run less tests than we um, could potentially do, which is a bad thing. And of course, it should be a self-adapted method somehow. And what we actually do is we look at historic patterns. So if you have like a sequence of test execution, test suite executions over time like this, right? And you, for example, know that these three are actually false alarms, um, then we can mine certain patterns in here. And the particular pattern, this particular set of things would be, whenever test step two and test step n are failing, we think it's a false alarm, right? And the underlying um, assumption here is that um, if you have a test infrastructure issue, for example, like network card is broken or machine is broken, some kind of hardware defect, for example, um, it, you know, all the different tests that, if, for example, rely on network will fail, right? 
but it is very unlikely that it's, this will happen because you just change the code. There is an exception, for example, if you say, you know, my code base is, for example, you know, touching the network stack, and you just messed up the network stack, and this can, of course, happen, but in 99% of the cases, this is not not really the case. So for all branches, for example, that do not touch the network stack, this is not true, right? And so these test failure, what we call rules or patterns, are quite accurate. Um, so what we basically do is we can use machine learning to learn these patterns. So if you think about this, what we transform now, um, <clears throat> it's basically a matrix. So every column in the matrix is essentially a test step or one test that were executed. All the rows are events, which you can think of builds or test suite executions, right, that run all these tests. And you mark every test that failed in the system with a one. So for example, if you go to row two, then test C failed. Um, test E failed, test G failed, H um, failed as well. And then you have one column for false alarm, right, where you have some kind of ground truth. This can either be manual ground truth or things that we have learned historically, right? And then we find patterns in there and say, you know, which, which columns seem to be always one if the last column is one, two, right? Very simplistically. You can use machine learning to do this kind of thing for you. In our particular case, we use decision trees. And what you come up with essentially is a decision tree where you say, you know, if test A failed, well, if it didn't fail, then most likely this is not a false alarm. If it failed and test B failed as well, then this is a false alarm, and you can assign a probability for that, for example, 0.6. If test A failed, but test B did not fail, but test C failed, this is again a false alarm, and so forth, right? You get it. So it's kind of a decision tree where you have basically like an if statement, a long, you know, um, uh, a long tree of if statements in your code. You can do the same thing in machine learning, and you get something like this. And you then, what you can do is you can actually classify new roles that come in, so let's say you you now run a new test suite, which is essentially a new road. You don't have the ground truth now, but you can use the decision tree to predict the false alarm column and then assign a probability to it and show this to the engineer, right, and say, well, you know, for example, you, you run now the test suite, A failed and B failed. You know, you say to the engineer, okay, this is most likely a false alarm. We think the probability of having a false alarm is 0.6%. It's your call, but we think this is a false alarm. Right, and so you can pre-classify this um, very quickly in the development process. It takes a split of a second to make this decision, and it is actually quite accurate. So we had some examples where we ran this on Windows and Office, and our precision is 84%. That means if we say it's a false alarm, in 84%, it is actually a false alarm. And then something what we call recall, that's 92%. Uh, that means actually we can identify 92% of all the false alarm as they appear in the system. Right. And you can fine tune this. You can actually get better than this. But then that's a different story. Right. But essentially the main point here is you can use machine learning to, you know, guide people to identify false alarms and give them more um, background knowledge about what is actually happening. You can also present this particular um, a decision tree, for example, which can be very helpful for engineers to grasp, uh, you know, why is A and B failing, and uh, if A and B fails, that's already a false alarm, what are have A and B in common, how can we untangle this, how can we make this better, how can we make it more robust. So very important. Um, okay, so we, we have deployed this, it is actually in production, or at least some teams are already using this, um, and test failure is now if we would be perfect, test failures would translate to code defects, right? That's great because now every test failure is really a code defect and we don't waste our time inspecting uh, test failures which are due to, um, to, test, uh, to test infrastructure issues. But the problem is, um, you know, we still need to cut test time because we still don't have enough time to run all the tests. So um, if you think about this, we want to uh, reduce execution frequency. And essentially what we want to do is if you, you know, every test is kind of has a reliability and an effectiveness measurement. Um, essentially what you would say, you know, every test that is high reliable and high effective, irrespectively how you measure that, um, you want to run that as often as possible. Reliability is false alarms, essentially effectiveness means, you know, that doesn't actually find bugs at all. Um, and so all the tests that are basically in the, in the green part, you want to maximize the execution frequency for those tests because they seem to be very reliable and effective tests. And for everything else that doesn't fit into the green area or you can't put them somehow in the green area, 
uh, you want to reduce the execution frequency, right? Um, but you don't want to sacrifice code quality, so it means um, you don't want to, you know, remove these tests completely because you still need them because they once in a while find a code defect and you still maybe they're testing some very important constraint that is very unlikely that you will ever violate it, but you have to have the test to check that you ensure that you will never violate this particular um, uh, constraint. So what we do is basically we run every test at least once in this, you know, outer loop or in this branching tree example like in Windows but we want to reduce the execution frequency. So we don't run these tests that are not in the green bucket on every single you know, integration request from every branch to the next higher level, but let's say we always run them before we actually integrate the, uh, the code changes into the trunk uh, branch of the tree. So we, will f you, we, we risk basically by finding defects later in the process, which is more expensive, but we reduce execution frequency, which means we save time. Um, and so basically what we do here is we, we, we basically treat test um, executions as money or executing tests costs money and we ask what's the return of investment. So if I'm about to execute a test, what is my expected return of investment? And for that we use a cost model and very high level again we say before we run an actual test we ask what's the expected cost of executing a test and what's the expected cost of not executing a test. And I will define this in a second, but you know, high level speaking, if the cost of executing a test is higher than the one of not executing it, why would you test, right? Because it is cheaper to take the risk. Keep in mind that we run all the tests at least once before we integrate the code into the trunk branch, right? So we can only make this trade-off if we have executed this test already. So how do we define cost of execution? Well, essentially it's the time, it's the cost that we you know, have to invest to run this test. So essentially it's machine cost per time times the time we need to execute this test. That's, you know, you derive this historically, how long does it on average take to run this test? And then you have a cost for a potential false alarm. And essentially what you can do there is you you say, you know, if we, you know, now if we decide to run this test, but it reports a false alarm, how long on average do we take to try it or to inspect this test failure, right? Let's say on average it takes us two hours to find out that this test failure is actually not a code defect but a false alarm. And we have to multiply this with the cost of an engineer, at least one engineer that has to do the inspection. And we multiply this with a probability and the probability is essentially the probability of this test reporting a false alarm in the first place. So if, the pro if you have a higher reliable test that has never reported a false alarm in its lifetime, then this additional cost of a potential false alarm would be zero and you're down to execution time only. The cost of not running a test or skipping a test is the potential cost of elapsing a bug to the next high-level branch. Um, and essentially, I'm not going through the details here, but essentially it is about um, you have, to, you know, if, we not, if we're not executing the test and we will eventually find this bug on the next, you know, on one level up to towards WinMain, at some point we will freeze the branch and the higher we go up in this tree, the more engineers will be impacted. So if we, for example, freeze WinMain, which is the trunk branch, 10,000 people will just sit there and, you know, will be blocked. That is a, the worst case scenario, and that would mean, you know, we have to pay 10,000 engineers for some time to do nothing. Uh, and again, we multiply this with the probability of finding a code defect in the first place. So if you have a test that have never found a bug, um, that this cost will be zero, right, because the, the risk is zero. Um, if, you, if, you know, your test is always finding a bug in every execution, well, then you have a different problem, but anyway, you know, theoretically, then this cost will be very, very high. That's just a simulation result, so if we execute this now on Windows um, 8.1, then I just want to point out some things, so there is, we can actually reduce by 40% all test executions, that means 40% of all tests executed could have been thrown away, so for 40%, the cost of running a test is actually higher than the of not running it. We suppress the number of false positives using this technique alone by one-third. Um, so that's the good part. The, get, the bad part is that we elapse 0.2% of all the bugs to one, you know, to a, to a, to a, um, so we basically, 0.2% of the bugs are found later in the process, which means increased cost. But very importantly, if you look at the cost balance in here, then this is a positive cost balance, which means that we would save money. So in this particular case, we would have saved $1.5 million uh, on Windows 
alone uh, by reducing the test frequency, right? And very importantly, and that's maybe a, a very interesting point here, the, the machine cost is actually the main driving factor here, right? Because we all treat machines as very, uh, very cheap, and they are very cheap, but you know, if we run millions of tests every single day on, on thousands or tens of thousands of machines, you know, it, it, it's accumulating. And so, you know, we, we pay $1.5 million for machine cost that we could have saved. Uh, without not impacting code quality uh, so much. Okay, great, we are testing faster, but there's another challenge, but I'm running out of time. So the question is, are we testing reality? So even if we are testing very, very good, we have no false alarms and we have a lot of tests that are, you know, top notch. The question is still, what is actually used in the out there in the world and are we actually testing reliability? Um, or, you know, what is happening in the, in the field? What's the difference between us validating users are using things? What is different? How often are you, people using stuff that we are actually not validating internally? And then, you know, can we derive some kind of test scenario from that? So basically, if we use, you know, uh, telemetry data at the customer side, can we learn what kind of scenarios are users actually executing and can we derive test and verification scenarios from that that we can then uh, somehow automate, right? But that's an open research question. Um, okay, so very quickly wrapping up. So development process needs um, to change radically. Um, we are doing this already. A lot of companies are doing it. We're, we are still slow. Um, testing significantly impacts development speed. Verification time defines the lower bound of how fast we can actually deliver software. Um, we need more suitable or we need suitable application, uh, applicable test strategies, right? We cannot afford to, you know, waste too much time. Um, we need to be very clever in, in selecting the test that we need to, um, to run. Um, and testing can be more than just verification, right? It can actually also be combined with telemetry data um, to provide feedback loops for engineers. Um, are the scenarios that we actually encoded are actually used? How are they used or are they used any kind of differently? Okay, and with that, um, I guess Ronan is taking back control. So thank you so much, and any kind of questions are highly welcome, of course. Just checking, can people, can you hear me okay? Good. I can hear you now. Yep. Great. Now, um, as I mentioned, sorry folks, I might just mention those briefly, the three automation, or the two remaining automation webinars, Dorothy on Wednesday and Jared on Thursday. Finally, I just mentioned that the cause for submissions is now open, so if you'd like to see yourself presenting at your star, even on automation, the Submissions have opened and the topic for this year is learning to test, testing to learn. And that is decided upon by Schmel, who's our conference chair this year. And the deadline for submissions is the 5th of February 2016. So if you're taking a break over Christmas, it would be a great time to get working on your submission. And uh, we hope to see you there, your star. That will be taking place in Stockholm from the 31st of October to the 4th of November in 2016. So finally, we'll get to our questions. Um, we have a few questions there, um, Kim, but I'd like to start with um, one um, uh, relating to, um, I read it out here and you can answer for me. In the beginning you said that testing web services is so much easier than box products. Why is that the case and how do you define easier? All right, so um, 
I think it's not so much easier, and uh, well, easier is a, is a difficult word, right? But in a sense, um, so as I said, if you have a web service, you're controlling most of your environment, right? You're controlling the hardware, you're controlling the software, you control the full data center. That means that you pretty much know where your system will run on, in which environment your system will run on. And that will cut down a lot of the individual environments that you have to also test for, right? That's one part. So if you think about Windows, Windows has to be tested on a lot of different scenarios or any kind of software that goes to an engineer or to a, you know, to a desktop somewhere in the world. You don't know what the hardware will be like, what drivers will be installed, and so forth. Um, as a service, you 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 know you are in control, and you can also, for example, do much fine granular um, kind of uh, user testing, right? So you can you have a lot of services have test beds where you know there's one particular time zone that they choose that they just deploy the newest version on, and only if it runs there very nicely and smoothly for a day that it will then deploy for you know, a broader audience. So in that sense, it 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 cuts down a lot of the things, uh, environments that you have to test for. That's one part, and the other part is um, fixing tests, uh, fixing bugs is much easier, right? So as you do, you have a fix, you have a bug, you fix it, you deploy, you have a fixed, right? If you have a box product, then you have to ship this fix actually to the customer, and you have to rely on the customer to actually install also the patch on the machine, and that can be very, very difficult and very, very hard. Okay, Ken, thank you very much for that. I have a very simple question for you next. Uh, someone is uh, asking you to explain, Lena wants to know simply, what is dog fooding? And can you explain it further? Oh, okay, dog fooding, yeah, sorry for that. Um, so dog fooding is essentially um, um, internal testing. So what we do is, um, you know, if you, if you have a system, let's say, for example, you have Visual Studio. Um, if you want to try out Visual Studio first, it means that every Friday we build the newest version, so we take a snapshot of the current trunk branch, um, right, of the, of the code base. Uh, we make it a product and we deploy it to the individual engineer's desktop. So meaning that people developing Visual Studio have to live with the version that they have developed in the last week. That means, um, you know, if you mess something severely up, then it means that all your team will suffer because they get a very instable build from last week. And that's called usually dog fooding in industry. Um, yeah, so it's essentially internal testing. So once a week we make a snapshot, deploy it to the machines of the engineers internally, so they, you know, alpha, alpha test the system on their desktop already, and then can also create bug reports, give feedback to the engineers. So that's essentially what dog fooding is about. Okay, this, uh, I think that's a very comprehensive answer. I uh, hope to answer that question, Lima. And Seema's asked uh, a question about um, the test cases. So they ask, uh, what is the time taken to run the 1 million plus test cases? And uh, the second question, uh, do you write the tests for each of the branch and how do you manage the tests on the main branch? <laughs> That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I can't give you, I'm not allowed to give you a full answer to how long the tests actually run. So, um, the thing is the 1 million test cases are not executed in every test, but that's the broad thing that is executed on the full tree. But let's put it this way, um, running a single quality gate, so answering for one integration request, um, takes a high number of hours. So, it's a double digit number of hours. So it's more than 10 hours per request. So that gives you a scale of how, you know, how long it takes to wait for an integration request. And that, you know, if you if you look at the tree again, you see the depth of the tree. You can imagine how long it will take you from getting your code change from a leaf to the from the leaf node to the to the root node. Um, do we write these tests for particular branches? Yes. So essentially, um, engineers or testers are writing these tests. Uh, mostly of them are system integration tests. That means a lot of testers are involved here. So we're not testing what is implemented, but you know we're testing really the constraint. So we we get a constraint by, for example, a customer, or you know there's a new uh, EU regulation coming out. We code this as a test, and we will submit it to the quality gates. Now the process of what test is executed in the quality gates, that's a very difficult decision making about the test teams. So the test teams are very good in determining 
it, it, it depends on what you are doing in a branch. Like, for example, you have a branch subtree. If you think about you have your root node and then you have multiple edges coming into the root node. Then individual subtrees are responsible for different kind of categories of changes. Let's say you have one subtree for Internet Explorer, one subtree for networking, one for kernel, and so forth. And so you run, of course, tests that are related to Internet Explorer more frequently in the Internet Explorer branch than you would do this in the kernel branch because, you know, these tests will never find a kernel issues, most likely, uh, hope, hopefully at least. Um, so it is very difficult to answer, but essentially it's a very, it's a human decision to say, okay, this is a test that is targeting these kind of changes. These kind of changes are coming up this tree um, so we have to execute them more frequently in this tree than in another tree, but be assured that all the tests run on all the branch subtrees at least once, right? So even if you, you know, you make a color code change, let's say you introduce a new color scheme to Internet Explorer, you still have to run the full-fledged kernel test suite. I hope that answers the question. Um. Yeah, that seems amazing, Kim. So it sounds like a, a lot of tests are right. Um, we've uh, two more questions I'm going to take, and then we'll wrap it up after that. Um, Darshish asks about um, your views on using impact analysis to guide decision tree to identify false alarms. So have you any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, decision tree is... Um one particular thing that we did that's not the only one, you can actually get better. It also depends on a bit on what kind of tests are we talking. So if we're talking about quality gates, decision trees are very good. If you go to the unit level, then decision trees are not the best, um, not the best um, model that you can come up with. Um, there are multiple, multiple things we did. Decision trees are the simplest to explain, but you are right. Um, so impact analysis, um, I assume you mean um, what do test runs, how do test some impact each other, right? So, for example, if A is failing, B will fail as well because, you know, A and B are roughly doing the same thing with some minor difference. Yes, we do this. Um, there are certain uh, mechanisms where we actually, you know, treat these patterns, so like of dependency. So, if A is failing, what is the chance of B failing? Or if you know that A and B are already failing, should we execute C or should we not execute C or how, how is the priority in which you should execute C? So it's very complicated, but we do these kind of things where we look at, you know, um, basically um, uh, probabilities, right, uh, conditional probabilities between individual test cases. And then even dynamically, we can change the order in which we run tests based on the conditional severity or probability um, basically that we gathered while we inspect the already passed test uh, cases. It's very difficult, but if you want to have, know more, you can also drop me an email. Great. Um, that's great, Kim. Um, another question we have is about uh, exploratory testing. and. Um, Someone's asking, where does exploratory testing fall into this new world of test automation? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I think a lot of things are not figured out yet. So to be to be honest, I think that most teams do not really do call, um, explorative testing at the moment. Um, so a lot of the tests are in the service world, you would say a lot of these things go to, you know, the customer. So if we, de for example, deploy something in a test bed, which is time zone X, then we see how people are using this software. We're collecting a lot of telemetry and see, you know, how are they exploring the individual features? How can we face that, you know, kind of, you know, manual testing also. Um, so this is kind of things that are very, very expensive, very, very time consuming. Um, and I know that a lot of service companies and service products are doing this um, kind of in on the fly, right? So they're not doing this internally anymore. Um, also test generation, for example, all these things, there is no time for doing it anymore. So I think once we are in a stage where we can actually cut down test time to say, you know, we have spare cycles, we have, we have cut down our testing to the core part, which seems to be good enough, to a degree where we actually can, you know, invest another hour per day to run more tests. This will come in again, 
but at the moment since you know teams have to cut down their development process by half or even you know three quarters there is no room for even thinking about something like this and it's very unfortunate but that's unfortunately very very real so I can't answer you this question 100% but I would love to see it but I think that most teams do not even do it at the moment okay. but that doesn't mean that it, that's the way it should be right Great. Um, if you have some more time, Kim, we have a few more questions. There seem to be flooding in now. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. Um, I actually have one from a fellow presenter this week, Dorothy Graham. So she's asking a question. She's, sure. um, she makes a comment. I'm very surprised to hear that code reviews don't find defects. Have you considered looking back at the extremely effective de defect finding practices of software inspection, e.g. using checklists compared to sources, individual roles, focus on priority defects, slow deep inspection yes we have and um, so we were surprised too and we think the problem is that we are doing too many code reviews slash inspections so the problem is if we I said we spend an hour per engineer per day doing a code review that means if you know you have an eight hour day let's say two are gone by meetings already you have another hour doing code reviews it first depends on the quality of the code review. So, how you know what's the change under review? If that's a change that has a hundred files changed, most likely I'm not going to find anything because I have no clue what's going on anyway. Um, and secondly, um, if I'm getting, let's say, 20 or 30 code reviews a day, the time I invest per code review, going very detailed over it, is very limited. So. In some sense, we think, and that's some, something we work on at the moment, is we want to reduce the actually the number of code reviews we are doing, um, and that we think will increase the um, the quality of the code review, right? Because you know, it, you know, it's it's very simplistic. Uh, if humans are overwhelmed by something, they just drop the quality, and and. And having said that, we also had a lot of interviews with teams because we own a code review tool internally here. Um, the most effective code reviews are not done over tools, they are done at the desktop. So say I have a very complicated change, I go to my buddy in the next room and say, you know, do you have 10 minutes, can you come and look over something on my, on my screen? We go there, we have a code inspection, that is more like really a code inspection in the classical sense. I explain to him what I'm doing and he can, you know, follow me and then say, well, there's logical error in there or whatever. But the classical code review as we have a tool, we post it there and I'm waiting for a sign off and somebody will do it. That is, I think, not a very efficient way of doing it. So I think it really depends on how you conduct code reviews in the first place. Okay, that's a, I think, a very comprehensive answer. Uh, Another long question from Nick Shaw, and um, he's asking you, Kim, um, about uh, integration testing approach. So he asks, are you going from a team environment with mocked services to an integration environment with no mocks and other teams actively testing? If so, for integration specific tests, you use only a very small specific subset of tests. I wonder if these are typical workflow or end-to-end -end style tests, so different tests for different environments. We have, yes. Um, so let me get that, um, let me sort this. And so basically, there are multiple levels. Um, so we have tests that are highly mocked, right? That's usually what we run in our unit testing frameworks. I mean, there is not such thing as in the academic world in terms of, you know, unit tests. So there is not a test that only tests this particular unit. So most of the unit tests that we see are already multi-component tests, and there's a lot of mocking going on. Um, there are some things that are very hard to mock. Um, like, for example, if you think about we have a team that, you know, Azure is testing virtual machines. Now, you know, mocking a full-fledged virtual machine kind of set of commands that you can put in can be very hard, very challenging, but we have some tools supporting people to do it. And something we're doing at the moment is we look into tools and say, you know, you have an end-to-end -end test. Um, how can we help you to make this end-to-end -end test that seems to test only one particular aspect of the code um, to actually go towards a unit test or towards a mocked multi-component test, let's put it this way. 
But it's a hard question because, you know, um, what would you mock? What's the right border to mock? Um, and then we also run always into the problem is, is it worth the effort? So that means how much time, how much engineers do we have to pay to make this mocking happening, right? Let's say we have 60 men months, you know, to write this particular mock or to, to transform all these end-to-end -end tests to mock tests. And then we ask, what's the expected number of bugs we will find with these tests? Are these tests still as good as before? Are they not as good as before? How many t bugs do we actually find? And if you say, you know, these tests found one bug anyway only, then maybe the 60 months are not even worth investing. So it is always a question, at least in industry, about, you know, how much money do we have to put on the table to make this happening? And how much money will we save in the end? So in another word, you know, is it cheaper to live with the pain of having an end-to-end -end test or is it worth investing and turning this to a mocked multi-component test? So since we have a lot of different teams, the answer could, you know, has a big variety, but teams want to go from end-to-end -end test to mock test, but sometimes it's not as easy as it sounds to write a mock, to find also the right borders to, to write a mock. Okay, can I hope that answers the question. I hope so too. Um, we're going to take. I'm going to take one more question. But uh, what yeah. I might do, Kim, if you're happy, is a uh, I'll start a thread on Test Huddle, and people can submit questions there if they have any further questions. If the questions weren't answered, and sure. Possibly yeah. you might be able sure. to dip in and out um, and answer those questions. So if your question isn't uh, answered, folks, I apologize. But uh, do go to testhuddle.com. I set up a thread there, uh, which you should see in your screen now, and uh, you can submit your questions there to Kim, and uh, he should be hopefully he'll be able to answer them. So Kim, I'm going to leave you with the final question, which is a very uh, easy one, I'm sure. And it's from Amory Daly, and Amory asks, in terms of quality, how does Kim quantify a successful release? Say again, sorry, you broke up. How how do I classify? In terms, in terms of quality, how do you how do you quantify a successful release? Wow, um, that depends highly on the product, um, and I guess my answer would way differ from the product team's answer. But for a successful release is if the customer is satisfied, and that can that is a very you know you know not very precise answer, but essentially if the experience of the customer is met then that is successful. We can even have, let, let's put it this way, if you have a bug in your code but nobody detects this bug, who cares, right? I mean, we care, but the customer doesn't because he will never experience the problem. So in that particular sense, you would say it's still, you know, we might be very buggy, but, you know, nobody expects it anyway or uncovers that we are buggy, so it can be very successful. Now, if you have the business division, people would say the more money we make, the more successful we are. Um, if you go for an engineer, he would say, you know, the more features we put in and the faster we boot our system and so on, the more, you know, successful we are. Um, for my point as a, you know, somebody who cares about quality and privacy and security, if, let's say, the customer is satisfied in terms of reliability of the system, privacy, security, um, and the number of features, that is a successful release. Um, so I'm... I'm not a big fan to say, you know, we fulfilled our internal criteria all and, you know, we have a checklist internally that we, when we checked everything so that's successful. If we still, you know, see customers being unhappy about the product, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that we checked all our boxes because people are not happy. For me, a successful release is really if the customer is happy um, in all respects, right? And that is, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not a very precise answer, but for me, um, the customer is the most important thing, right? And if he's happy, if he's willing to use the software, if he's referring the software, he 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 buys a license. We seem to be successful. That sounds great, Kim. I I can imagine it's hard to give a precise answer to a question like that. Anyway, you could be talking sure. all day on that question, or even present another webinar on that question if you wanted to. Oh yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So if um, you ask, I guess if you if you ask six people, you get seven answers. So exactly, I can imagine. Yeah. So uh, we'll wrap it up there, folks. Again, thanks for attending today. And I want to thank Kim for uh, getting up bright and early to present this morning sure. or your time. Um, as I said, we might um, 
continue the conversation on test huddle. So if people have questions, they can head over there if the question wasn't answered. Um, for now, though, uh, thank you, Kim, and uh, thank you, folks, for uh, tuning in. Don't forget the rest, rest of the webinar series later on this week. But now for me, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. So take care and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.